Blaster, just take it up to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land, Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following a Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Five Charlie Sierra, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Niner clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's, let's let's listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's cleared to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Tail dragger. Let's see. What we got a tricycle. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tricycle, put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green uh, green dot, then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine all the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. Charlie's here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, right. go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My okay, Here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the pikeman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out the, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to re-sequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once you're out, dude. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get, uh, try to get you back here. Can our got the uh, jet inside? Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're supposed to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind you yeah, out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that after 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? RV. An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers. At the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Sorry, Simon. See you in a minute. <laughs>
That's the price Simon. <laughs> so, sorry all uh, right hello let's start again hello welcome thank you very much for joining us on this thursday night the weather's been bloody awful and so uh, i hope we can bring a little bit of sunshine to you uh, a little bit later and we've got an absolutely fantastic guest who i can see waiting there in the green room alongside virtually alongside that is uh, simon who's waiting to deliver weather you've seen simon earlier but first of all i would like to say a huge thank you to sky demon the team at sky demon uh, and just generally sky demon for sponsoring the live stream um i can't remember how long we've been working with sky demon now on this but it's a long time so uh, i think this is the 76th week however whatever 76 is divided by 52 one and a bit isn't it one and one and one and three. a half mate three-fifths or something but anyway here you go so let's uh let's give you this week's sky demon tip from tim himself no nope. doing well tonight <laughs> here you go hi i'm tim, I'm tim. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim from Skydemon. Welcome to today's top tip. Use our flyable conditions feature to quickly see how good the weather is likely to be for flying. This colors the map based on the forecast cloud ceiling and visibility. You can configure the feature by long pressing on the key at the bottom of the screen here and set it up for your own idea of good flying weather and marginal flying weather. Bad weather is then colored red Marginal weather is coloured yellow, and good weather is clear or green. Remember, this is a forecast based on your preferences. If you like, you can use the What's Here menu to inspect the flyable conditions. Here we can see the ceiling is down at ground level. Or here, we have a ceiling at 2,000 feet AGL and fine visibility. For more information on any of our features, go to skydemon.aero and choose Help and Support. For, wow. for a moment there, I thought that was going to be the world's shortest Sky Demon top tip. Just Tim going. Yeah. For a moment, I thought I I messed up that edit, didn't I? I wonder what I've done. Um, but no, apparently I'm putting the list. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I'm going to steal that and use that at some point in future. Um, yeah, excellent. So, uh, right. As you've already seen him, let's introduce Simon. Hello, Hello. Simon. How are you doing? Oh, I'm all right, thank you. Are we all okay? Well, we're we're fine. We're fine. Good, um, good. It's going well, I see. Yeah, I, I noticed the flyable conditions on Skydemon, which I know you had something to do with help helping them out on. I guess there's not been a huge amount of flyable conditions recently. No, no, any... not really. Not not many, not many. And of course, Tim's always saying that that's a forecast uh, that you see on Skydemon with flyable conditions. You know, don't use it as a go no go. But it's a great tool to give you an indication for what's around, isn't it? I think uh, lots and lots of people are, are are using that now. But it is a really great addition to, to Skydemon. And and like you said, in not many flyable conditions around over the last few days. But I have got some good news for you because it looks like it may be getting a little bit better particularly into next week. So uh, sh shall I show you the graphics? Let's bring those yeah. graphics Let me, let's, uh, let's see if it's going to take a little bit of faffing this. Hang on a second. Okay. Let's you add this in. We need to swap you over there. Excellent. There you go. That looks all right, doesn't it? Wonderful. Right. So uh, bear with me just one second because I've got the last graphic on there. We we'll go backwards, <laughs> shall we, this time? Putting, putting the lesson to seamless, Simon. <laughs> yes, exactly. I wonder where I might have heard that before. Okay, so here we go. Let's go back to let's go back to Friday. Uh, so this is the forecast then for tomorrow. Um, we've got this week uh, a cloudy front. Now I always say, just think of cloud as fronts as areas of clouds and rain. Don't get too hung up with them, you know, about what they're like in 3D. This is an occluded front. Occluded fronts you sometimes get embedded QNMs running along them. And this is quite a weak feature. It's sort of dying out tomorrow. So it's sort of southwest Scotland, northern England into northern parts of the Midlands. It's got residual cloud left in it and probably bases looking at the ceiling forecasts here. Uh, the uh, green colour is indicating about two to 4,000 foot uh, above ground level. So for most areas, actually, even along that front, it is semi sort of flyable to the south of it and to the north of it conditions are better sunny spells coming through but it is going to be windy particularly earlier on tomorrow notice the ice bars close together there gusts could get to 35 
perhaps even 40 knots early tomorrow morning. But actually during the afternoon, it's this little ridge of high pressure that's across Ireland. That's the end shape in the ice bars. As that comes in in the afternoon, rapidly we'll see a decrease of wind speeds across England and Wales. So actually later tomorrow doesn't look that bad and decent viz as well. Saturday, yuck. Low pressure in control. Centred off northeastern Scotland. Fronts are going to pass their way eastwards, taking cloud, taking outbreaks of rain with them. It's going to be windy as well. Again, you see the ice bars close together there. So gusts of 35 to 40 knots quite easily. Yes, it'll brighten up from the west later on in the day, but still it's not going to be very pleasant. And the rain base is less than a thousand feet. Once that clears through, top uh, base is about three thousand feet, tops up at about fifteen to twenty thousand feet in the showers. So it's a windy afternoon basically. Doesn't look particularly brilliant. Sunday we find uh, an area of rain that kind of just drifts across southern areas. And you see it here Southern Ireland, Southwest England, parts of Wales, that's sort of showery and base is about two to three thousand feet. Still quite breezy in the south, but not as windy as it will be on Saturday. So actually southern areas improving through Sunday, getting sort of better as the day goes on. But I think still western facing hills and coasts are going to be troubled by uh, clouds coming in at about 500 to 1,000 foot bases. Occluded front coming south again through Northern Ireland, through Northern England. Base is there probably about 3,000 feet. But through England and Wales, it looks as if the uh, base is about 4,000 feet for the rest of England and Wales, I should say. Looks not bad uh, for the afternoon. However, the more interesting stuff up north here, to the north of Scotland, the flow going more into a northerly, that's going to bring in some polar maritime air. Yes, a few showers for northern Scotland. Falling freezing levels as well means that those showers go wintry, but through the early stages of next week, these northerlies push southwards through the country. So for most of us, we should be into decent conditions, decent visibility, bases between about three and 4,000 feet, tops about twelve to 15,000 feet, one or two snow showers around, particularly around the coast, but inland areas look as if they will fare much better. So actually, early to middle stages of next week, not looking bad at all, just darn cold. Okay, I'll leave you with that for now. Uh, I've got one, one more place left on my... Uh, Aviation Weather School Part 1 on the consecutive Tuesdays to the 31st of January and the 7th of February. Go to weatherschool.co.uk now and you can book your place. Right, I think that's just about it. Have a great uh, have a great weekend. Before you go, Simon, yeah. um, just, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, the the isobars, obviously, the closer together, the windier it is. Is there an easy rule of thumb that goes, oh, they're 70 miles apart, divide it by three and it'll be 20 knots or something? It's it's pretty tricky. What the, the way that I normally view it is that if we've got an ice bar, if you imagine the, the channel, take the English Channel, if you've got an ice bar over southern England and an ice bar over northern France, and they're running from sort of west to east, so you've got sort of a nice, a nice distance between them. That typically is a wind of around 15 to 18 knots, that sort of distance. So if you've got a distance, what would you say that is probably about sort of 70, 80 nautical miles distance? that's about 15 to 18 knot wind. And for most of us, I suppose, that's flyable depending on the direction of the runway, of course. But yeah, that's the yeah. rule of thumb that I, I, I generally use. Okay. Brilliant. Right. Thank very much. Anytime. Well, thanks very much, Simon, and uh, okay. we'll hold you to that good weather. See you soon. <laughs> See you Bye. 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 Ah, there you go. Let's bring you back to normal. Wow. Ah. There you go. Uh, Johnny's back as well, so that's brilliant. Right, it must be time for club promotion, Johnny. Yes. Yeah, so if you're not a member of the Flyer Club, you can join today. Just go to flyer.co.uk forward slash membership. It's going on, on the bottom there. Um, we've got a £5 a month offer, which really is an absolute bargain for everything that you get for that £5. So you get access to all of the content that's on the website, all the features, all the news, all the videos, live stream extra plus all the free landing vouchers, which this month are Perth, High Wycombe, how do you pronounce it? Straven? Straven. <laughs> Booker. I'm going to rename it. And uh, Rutherford East, which is up in York. So, yes, some great landing vouchers for um, January there. And we'll have more to come in February. And we've got lots more planned for the rest of the year, which I think, Ian, you're going to mention about. I was just going to say, the other thing that you uh, get as a member of the Flyer Club for your five quid a month is basically a monthly webinar. This uh, kicks off 2023 next Tuesday, half past seven. Um, we've got Thomas Borchert, who's the editor-in-chief of Flieger Magazine in Germany. He's going to talk to us all about flying around Germany, VFR touring, how they work, their airspace, some of their, some of their rules, their, their kind of... Their, 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 
the height of pedantry when it comes to circuit uh, keeping and talk about landing fees and we'll talk a little bit hopefully about customs inbound outbound flight plans all that basically a good primer on flying around germany germany is actually a fantastic country to fly around some really good stuff but uh, this will just make it easier and we'll be bringing you one webinar not on germany clearly a month one webinar a month throughout the year with a whole range of stuff some really good stuff coming up and we'll have that whole list published soon and so you get that for a fiver as well so if you're not a member just join um and while you're there click the like and stuff like that on this video um so yeah there you go um just for you johnny david Ead says oh, even i got it wrong straven cheers straven. david <laughs> <laughs> right Dave, I've realized I forgot to upload the picture, continuing my super smoothness of this, <laughs> the, uh, of, of the new com. New com the new compilation. This is the, the new compilation of Flyer is uh, out. It was out uh, yesterday, Wednesday. Um, if you remember, we produce the magazine, if you like, as a downloadable PDF that you can read on any device. And it contains the last four weeks worth of content that we've put up on the website. So... The cover story of, of this particular compilation is it's got the headline Asia RT and it's where Annabel Cook, who's in the comments tonight, uh, takes a flight from Jersey to Blackbush, landing at different types of airfield and passing through different levels of airspace. And she talks to, she's talked to various controllers about what you should really say and what, you, what you're expected to say and what you should what you're going to hear back. So there's diff you know, different levels of airspace, it's different things. It's a really, really good read. Annabel's done a great job on that. The, uh, another feature is with from Andy Talkington, uh, who's a, a reader of Flyer. Uh, Andy, it's Andy's personal story of returning to flying after having had major surgery to place a, replace a, a heart valve. Yeah, so we can imagine coming back from a heart operation. There's quite a few hoops to jump through, but with the help of his very good AME, uh, he made it. And so he's back flying now. It's a great story. Flying Adventure is our very own Sarah um, on a flight to Latuque. And obviously the magazine continue, keeps uh, everything else, so all the reg usual regulars, including a piece by Rachel Ramsey when she flew through the London heli lanes in a helicopter, obviously, on what must have been one of the clearest days ever. It's just amazing views in her photographs. So that's it. You can go along to the section we call magazine on the website. And if you're a member of the Flyer Club, you can download the PDF. So you get that in your fiver as well. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you very much for that, Dave. Um, we're going to do the news slightly different. Uh, they are, in fact, great. Yeah. Sweet. We're going to do the news slightly differently tonight because, frankly, there's not a huge amount of news. So we thought we'd kind of just uh, flit around and, and see what's kind of taken our interest this week and, and have a quick chat about that from a kind of newsy-ish point of view. And, Ed, I see you are listed as first up here. I do. I have the first story, which you've, uh, if you've seen Flyer and probably seen a, a, a other websites, it's been the news about a drone pilot prosecution. Uh, so this was a drone pilot who uh, nearly caused a serious accident at um, a, uh, an event in Buxton last year. Uh, it was uh, a Buxton Carnival in July 2022, and there was a fly pass being made by the RAF's Battle of Britain Memorial flight. It was their hurricane. Uh, so the airspace, the the area was um, had temporary restricted airspace around it because of um, uh, because of what was going on there. So you know, normal flyers would keep clear of that. However, the, a, a um, person on the ground chose to fly their drone. Now, obviously, the restricted airspace also covers the operation of drones, and um, so images captured on the day showed the the drone flying dangerously close to the hurricane. Uh, and it was being watched by 20,000 people on the ground. Uh, now, interestingly, I, so I was speaking to Jonathan Nicholson at the CAA earlier, who gave me a bit more background on this. And he was saying, actually, it's, it was the police that actually followed all of this up. And they pursued the prosecution just with and kind of referring to the CAA for advice. Um, but um, it was a 49 year old man from Buxton. Uh, so the officers worked to identify the drone operator. Uh, Derbyshire Police um, said the 49-year-old man from Buxton, his drone was seized as part of an in the investigation and then analysis showed that it was flying over the site at the time of the fly past. Um, so um, first question to you guys, how do you think they caught the perpetrator? Um, normally it's because they put video up on YouTube, isn't it? It was, yeah, and I thought that must have been what happened here. 
Um, but actually talking to Jonathan, it was um, someone on the ground shooting photos of the hurricane was looking at their photos and they went, well, that's a hurricane. And then also in the shot and literally over kind of almost overlaid with the airplane was um, was a drone. So they sent them to the police and the police went, OK, we're going to investigate this. And um, as it's not very, not very difficult nowadays by a process of deduction, actually identified the chap um, but through that process. Um, I've seen the um, I've seen the photos. Are those images captured on the day publicly available? They are not. So there are images that were used in the prosecution. And uh, when I was speaking to Jonathan, he said, I can show you the images. Um, they apparently have circulated somewhere on the Internet, but aren't they aren't freely available. And unfortunately, I can't share them with you. However, I can describe to you exactly almost how it's been. <laughs> I've got my, my model here. So if that you hurricane's in trouble, Ed. I know. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry, Ian? That hurricane's in trouble. It's it got a spare yeah. wing. Yes, it was, I, it's the best I had. Um, but if okay. you can imagine it, and there was a little bit of um, telephoto compression, but if you've got your, your hurricane flying through the frame like this, if the drone is the end of my fingertip, it was kind of right, right about here. And, you know, the, the airplane made a few passes, drone was close. Uh, and Talking to Jonathan, I said, well, what's what's that sort of distance? And I think they estimated it around about 100 to 150 feet. So it was definitely, definitely putting an aircraft at risk. Um, a whole bunch of regulations ended up being broken here. Not only was it being operated in restricted airspace, it was also being flown over a large crowd. You can't do that. The drone code prohibits that. It was also the guy was operating it beyond visual line of sight. Another break there. And worst of all, it was endangering an aircraft. Um, and... Um, <coughs> Yeah, so the um, the guy who's been prosecuted, he's pleaded guilty to the charge, and um, he's set to appear uh, in court um, in court in February for sentencing. So, um, as Jonathan reminds us, drone users have an obligation to understand and follow the rules. Uh, when while flying a drone can be great fun, it also comes with significant responsibilities, and people need to check airspace before they fly. Now, it turns out there's a piece of software like Skydemon for drone users that's free. Um, that tells you, because I said, well, surely they know about these restricted bits of airspace because some drones have um, have like geo um, sorry, geo fencing. And geo fencing is provided by a number of the manufacturers, but it doesn't keep up to date with restricted airspace. But there are programs where a drone user and you take your test and you, you acknowledge that you know all the sources of, of information and stuff. And Jonathan said, there's software out there that tells you where all these things are. So there's no excuse, really. So... Um, uh, my last question to you guys: How many, um, so um, how many UK registered drone users do you think there are? Because this is people who have the, the flyer ID. That's not our ID. That's that's what the the CAA call it. So this is flyer IDs allocated to drone flyers by the CAA in the UK. Two thousand. No, it's two hundred and ninety thousand. What? Wow. 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 All, paying, wow. all paying ten pound each every year. So. Well, in that case, that could, they, we can cross subsidise our licences and stuff, can't we? <laughs> That's that it. And you also, you also, uh, so you you have to register for a flyer ID to fly a drone. Uh, if you own a drone, then you also have to have an operator ID. Well, that renews every five years, and that's free. And um, this drone story reminded me that actually I needed to re renew both of mine because uh, both of mine were due at the end of this month. So. Mm. Wow! Well, bloody hell! If he's uh, coming right. back to sentencing in February, yeah, that means that they're considering quite a hefty sentence, because otherwise it would have been just a, you know, a fine on the day that be it. I would, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in, endangering an aircraft is a serious okay. charge. Mm. Endangering an aircraft over a big crowd. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And like we said, you know, it's it's not just one. It's actually there were four, essentially four rule breaks here. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna guess that you should pack a toothbrush. Okay. <laughs> I think if, you, if, it's, if sentencing has been delayed like that, there's a def, there's definitely a, definitely a chance of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't joking. I was no. uh, Jane Gifford says, um, uh, "What size drone?" I, from the photos, it looked like it was um, a DJI Mavic Pro, which is kind of about yay big, reasonably reasonably large thing, and that was my guess looking at the photos. 
Um, little top little tip here. There's a whole bunch of people. I only learned this yesterday, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say it out loud as if I know what I'm talking about. If you think you've got a, a drone under 250 grams and you don't have to register it, that is true unless it's got a camera on, and then you do. So even a little one with a camera on, you still have to register it. Yes, yeah, because DJI make a little drone called the Mini, the uh, the Mavic Mini, and um, and they go, oh, it's only 249 grams, but it has a drone, it has a camera on it, so you need to register it. Yeah, right. Right. Cool. Moving on. I, I, I keep I keep fancy buying one of those. But I haven't bought one yet. <laughs> Darren Lund says, "Bet the drone footage footage look good." From what I from what I saw of the photos, I'm sure it probably was. But you know, you, you don't want that footage. Okay, we have uh, t time is marching on. So, Dave, Nuki, yes. Uh, New yes, Newcastle. So the, uh, the the airspace safety website, which is run by the CAA has issued uh, a new, what they call a narrative, about infringements uh, around a certain area. In this case, it's Newcastle. So the um, it's a 33rd in, uh, narrative um, in a series that uh, they've, they've done to identify infringement hotspots in the UK and to provide pilots operating in the, in the area with useful information on airspace and infringement prevention practices. So this one was produced by the Air Traffic Service Unit at Newcastle Airport. Airport. Now, they say the, there's a slight under, misunderstanding here because they say in, tw 19, in 2022 that airspace was infringed 12 times, nine times by microlites, three by military aircraft, twice by a single engine propeller aircraft, and once by a helicopter, which adds up to 15. So, um, <laughs> not quite sure what's going on there. But um, <clears throat> so, new, in this narrative, it's basically around 11 VRPs. Uh, which are in the in the airspace, and there's a their routes have been established for use by aircraft inbound or outbound from Newcastle Airport operating under VFR, and it's de you know, depending on one of the VRPs, depending where you're, where you're coming from and which runway is in use. The routes are all published in the Aero UK Aerodrome Directory, and they're also listed in the narrative. Now, while I was looking at this, I went looking around the rest of the website to see if there's any latest stats. And the 2022 infringements across the country, the final figure hasn't been determined yet because December's not been added to the list. But during up to the end of November, it was 1,331. Um, summer months were the highest, not surprisingly, uh, with 183 infringements in August alone. The, there's also on the website, it's a type of aircraft infringing. Um, it isn't available yet for 2022, but it is for 2021. And if you look at that uh, that breakdown by uh, about Newcastle, you see you might think that microlites were the main offenders, but it's not the case. In fact, normal aeroplanes, you know, uh, twins and, night and singles, were the bulk with sixty eight percent infringements. Helicopters second with twelve percent. Microlites and the military were both equal uh, with four percent of infringements of the total in uh, twenty twenty one. Wow. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it doesn't seem very many, does it? 12 or 15, oh, whichever right. it is, no. for a whole year. That's, I'd, I'd have said that was pretty low, to be yeah, honest. I think they're kind of, they've got into this habit of producing these narratives, and it is very useful on, on many of them. You know, they talk about Solent airspace, for instance, which um, is quite, you know, is, has been a real hotspot of infringements in the past. But if you look at um, if you look at the airspace maps, quite often the most infringed part is just a little sliver of aw awkward airspace, like a little corner where they've uh, uh, where, where where the the airspace um, is stepping up or stepping down for some reason. So sure, we, we, surely the the smart thing to do, as well as produce this guide, is is, is maybe to look inwardly and go, I wonder how we can improve that and make that less of a catch point. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, and then then all you have to do is go through the CAP sixteen sixteen process that Paul <laughs> Fraser Benison spoke about last week, which is probably a two year. The, the the bloke who flew the drone will get away with less punishment than going through a CAP sixteen sixteen process, mm. I imagine. Um, yes. but, but you're right. I think most of the time those little slivers, I I kind of think of them as they're not class G, but they're, they're class G for gotcha because um, they're just there <laughs> waiting to waiting to grab you, aren't they? Um, mm. but, Absolutely, but, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. And 
Yeah. Peter Sol says, at fly, will Kruj and will Kruchik Liz join at this? She is waiting in the green room. We just gotta we just gotta finish this bit, Hans Peter Thoughts, and she'll be there. I promise I can see her laughing in the in the in the room. There so we'll we'll hurry up. Johnny, we got I think we've got a little video for you. What have you seen? Yeah, so we've got a new EV toll that's been revealed. Yet another one. Yes. <laughs> um, and and we've got a quick picture. It's got trousered undercarriage kind of kind <laughs> of Ed's favourite. <laughs> this, this, this is a joke, surely. Yeah, you so know, I mean is... first of all, look at it. It it it's kind of come out slightly out of the Jerry Anderson design book. When you see it with its wings unfolded and, and propellers out, it's it's a strange old thing. But um it debuted at CES last week um it's now a fully functioning drive and fly ev toll apparently um 250 mile range by air that's what's proposed that's 70 cool. miles an hour on the road that's 150 cool. miles an hour in the air um and they're aiming for an on-demand ride service by 2026 um which means they are they're through the faa's kind of gate of will we even consider this for certification i think they're now so it's it's on it's on a road to somewhere you mean um, the letters landed on a desk yeah <laughs> um and they're, they're they're saying in some of the marketing speak um it's it's a new transport solution to address the cost of living the climate crisis affordable housing as well they, they quote. <laughs> but if, if you right. if you're fancying it here and you can play the video but um it's i'm going to play the video find, Five thousand dollars. Okay. Here there we go. you go. So it's it's an app. You can you can summon it on the app, and then this yep. turns outside your house, and your neighbours all laugh at you. Apparently, well, actually, <laughs> no one's home. No one lives in this part of town. I know. Um, the roads are completely deserted, aren't they? They are. Yeah. This must be in some kind of apocalypse. Maybe everyone's been killed in horrible drone accidents. Oh no, there's some there's some people there. And I, I, surely there's there's a bit of an oversight here because I reckon if you're driving down the street trying to you know get somewhere in your little drone type vehicle here, and you're most at risk of people crashing into you just through a sheer shock. You know, it's like WTF is this? Look so, all those empty car chargers. I know. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's run out of charge. Yeah, I know. Oh, this is, one, this is one of these segments where they they put a little bit of um, put a little bit of a disclaimer going. Some processes are speeded up. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that one definitely is. <laughs> oh, oh, it's left town now. It's 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 like you just know that inside there's there's people just maybe their hair is blowing freely and um, you know mm. they're they're just loving life. Oh, they off. will be beautiful people. They will. They will be beautiful people. They're going. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Eight eight hundred grand price tag. Yeah, <gasps> and again they've speeded that up, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now you've got the world's most expensive leaf blower. <laughs> wow, mm. it's not it's not a pretty looking thing, is it? No. I, uh, the, I, I this will probably make Liz laugh in the background, but you know a Chinook, which is not possible, poss not the most beautiful helicopter. You know that's definitely <laughs> going to win a prize for most Liz people. Yeah, this is just reaching for a GPMG now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's you know it's it's always they always show these things gliding around, and it's like oh it's, it's so peaceful, and we're we're just we're just we're we're just the quiet tra quiet people of travel, and you just know actually it's like being chased around the sky by angry wasps. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think for for, for me the, the the question is basically I don't. I'm not. I'm not at all convinced by this urban air mobility movement and the amount of passengers they think they're going to need. Um, to there's some little uh, yeah, just get that in there. The amount of passengers they're going to need to make it work. I think this is going to be the equivalent of the dot com bubble that will burst at some stage. But you know, hope, maybe I'll be wrong. Who knows? Who knows? Um, right, just uh, speeding up. The, uh, can I just uh, yeah. computing for, with the Teslas for charges? <laughs> Almost. Almost certainly. So um, just briefly then, the thing that kind of caught my eye this week um, and that was the subject of this month's column was really lead, uh, uh, lead in Avgas 100LL, which is basically um, tetraethyl lead 
is the stuff that that goes in there. Um, interestingly, that was introduced by in back in 1921 by General Motors when they were desperately trying to find something that would stop the knocking in the engine and, and destroying their engine. So it took about 80 years for it to go. At the time, it was considered safe, clearly, and the government approved it all. But 80 years later, they kind of knocked it on the head. Um, anyway, so there's a couple of research studies that went off in the US, and the University of Kent picked those up and kind of made a first order estimate by taking the US research studies and extrapolating the numbers and, and changing them a bit with, with the UK. And, and personally, I think there was a few assumptions they made there, which I don't agree with. Um, but one of the things they did reveal that's kind of not, not really in dispute or contentious is that the company contracted by the UK government to monitor lead pollution had somehow got one of the factors wrong when they worked out how much lead was being uh, put into the environment and underestimated it by no less than 14,000 times, which is a bit of a shocking figure, that 14,000 times. But obviously, you know, if you take a tiny amount, even 14,000 times a tiny amount is not huge. Uh, but the 14,000 number was what grabbed headlines in both Bloomberg and the Daily Telegraph. And, and that's kind of the whole thing's kind of spiraled. So I, I looked at some numbers. Um, does anyone want to guess how much Avgas in in liters consumed in the uk each year um a million 11 million 11 million liters so seven thousand eight hundred tons of avgas each year um just just to add a little bit of scale to that if for the um seven thousand eight hundred tons of avgas the jet fuel is 4.7 million tons of jet fuel um, and just over, just north of 8 million tonnes of unleaded petrol, that is, in, in cars. Um, so I guess the problem is that lead is a bit of a cumulative uh, polluant, really. Um, and then Chemistry World, a, a magazine that I didn't know existed until relatively recently, <laughs> uh, ran a thing back in 2021 saying that actually still half of London's lead pollution, which is much, much, much smaller than it was 20 years ago, um, comes from the lead uh, in cars that were driving around. It is such a heavy, enduring uh, pollution that uh, basically the dust in London is still suffering, if you want, if that's the right word, from the lead. Um, so the Telegraph picked up the story with the headline, Aeroplane Hobbyists Putting Thousands at Risk Thanks to Lead-Based Fuel. Um, just, you know, more, more clickbaity kind of stuff, which is uh, they, they, they kicked it off with a picture of a streak shadow which was running unleaded fuel. I guess they read the forum because that was pointed out on the flyer forum quite quickly because that picture now shows a 182RG instead uh, in, 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 in the US. Anyway, um, the other thing the University of Kent study did was got a whole bunch of charity, health-related charity CEOs to write to cabinet ministers saying you need to do something. Um, and the, the Green Alliance also wrote to, to the to, to government, but kind of surprisingly to me at least, uh, they, they wrote to the government saying, look, you need to do something, you need to incentivize better fuels. So the fact is that we do actually have a solution or a, a good part of the solution. UL91 exists, it just doesn't exist in enough places and in enough quantity. Um, and so uh, depending on which research you believe, between 59 and 70% of the UK fleet could run on UL91, but because it requires, you, you for, for regulatory reasons, you can't put UL91 in an Avgas 100LL tank that's been previously used, so you need to create your own installation. That whole double-bunded stuff is, is super expensive. But the government could pretty cheaply say, okay, well, we're going to knock 20p off a litre of UL91 for the next five years to encourage it, plus we'll provide some, some loans with a sort of payback as you sell to airfields to put some UL91 stuff in the government would actually make money out of it in the long run and it would it would cure an awful lot of things plus of course the gammy fuel in the us is is now approved in the us i think ed pointed out today you can actually buy an stc uh today but we just need ul91 in europe it's not easa approved yet so there there is a solution um and e AOPA, the LAA, and various other people have been trying to get government to do something and encourage it but it seems that there's been less not not particularly well received by government, or at least they haven't done anything about it, which is a bit of a pain. So, uh, and so yeah. Isn't there an EU ban on tetrahedral lead coming soon? There, there is coming in, in a couple of years. And the problem is that 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 ban will stop tetraethyl lead TEL being transported in through in in the EU, and all of the refineries producing Avgas for Europe are in the EU. So there is a window at the moment where those refineries are allowed to ask for an ex exemption. 
Um, but if that exemption is not granted or if for any other reason a, a stricter ruling comes in, TEL, which is only produced in the UK, in Ellesmere Port, funnily enough, for the world, um, we would have to ship our TEL to the US for them to refine the Avgas, for them to ship it back to us, uh, which would then mean, obviously, Avgas would be significantly more expensive than it is now because shipping from the US is not cheap. So, yeah, and 2025 is the is the ban for TEL in the EU. Although, as I say, there is a window at which you can apply. Um, but but I, I think the argument has always been in the past, we can't ban it because there's no substitute. Uh, now there is a, a substitute coming around and there, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Yes, you can hear a... <laughs> What a, what a, hang on a second. Yes, you're right. Oh, shut up. It's important, though, unfortunately. It is. And I think we'd all want, if we could have a lead alternative, a uh, lead free alternative tomorrow, we'd all pay for it and we'd all go flying with it. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. There's going to be a little bit of messing around here. So I'm going to bring on Liz. Hello, Liz. Hang on a second. Let's just Hi. make you into a star. Oh, what? Not that one. Oh, oh no. He's, that he's one. close up on down. Hang on. Musical chairs. Close it. Hang on. Hang on a second. Any moment now, it's going to work. Right, there. while Ian's doing that, I'll, I'll just give a quick intro. So, um, Liz, we're now, we're now joined by the RAF's longest serving female Chinook crew member and someone who's already generated quite a lot of positive messages um, and she's only been on the screen for about 10 seconds so on the forum <laughs> on the forum rod p um he said i can't be here tonight but if i were there i'd want to thank her for all she did a brave brave woman and dave w said the merc crews were and are truly extraordinary there are some astounding stories many of them many of them in award citations and at least one on camera from those days so lots oh. of lots of people really looking forward to hearing from you so just Liz, can you give us a bit of a background of what a Chinook crew member does? Not just wave giant hands at air shows, but it's more <laughs> than that. So that's all we do. It's really hard to pull the triggers and the guns when you're wearing that. It's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, no, so a Chinook crewman, um, we call ourselves sort of the jack of all trade, master of none. And essentially, we're the eyes and ears of the pilot down the back of the aircraft. So the Chinook is a bit of a mighty beast. It's actually 100 feet from tip to tip. Um, and obviously, if you're going to manoeuvre that size of a helicopter around the skies and into landing areas, uh, you need to make sure that you're clear of anything you could potentially hit. So our main bread and butter really is voice marshalling, which is essentially talking the aircraft around the landing sites and onto the landing sites um, and clearances around the tail and, and making sure that we keep 20 feet MSC, which is a safety clearance around the aircraft. So we we talk in the intercom and we talk uh, the pilot into the clearings. Uh, and if we're picking up any undersung loads, it's obviously quite quite important that we're above them so that we uh, we pick them up in the overhead so again it's all that really detailed voice marshalling and fine positioning um but big picture wise when we go away and we go to war uh, we do a lot of the radios the tack radios down the back of the aircraft which a lot of people didn't know um we do some of the navigation actually more the navigation back in the uk than when we're in a war zone we do a lot of it back here um and obviously man the weapons is a pretty important one when we're when we're out in, in up Herrick and places like that yeah, it's a bit of variety. No two days of the same. I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, I guess, with the size of the aircraft, if you're flaring to land, the wheels are, you know, a few feet off the ground, but the pilot's probably 30 feet above that and ahead, isn't it? So it must be it must be a tricky airplane to fly. Did, did people struggle? <laughs> well, actually, I think, you know, it's a pretty easy aircraft to fly. And we've got DAFIX now as well, which is digital FCS. So a lot of it, I mean, the pilot's I mean, they do earn their money, don't get me wrong, especially in places like Afghanistan. But yeah, it, the Chinook is notoriously easy to fly, actually, despite lots of myths. Um, but yeah, the, the, when we're flaring, certainly when we're trying to outrun a dust cloud, that's really when the whole crew earn their money. Because if you end up, you know, too high and the dust cloud catches up with you, which I'm sure you've seen in lots of pictures from us flying around in Iraq and Afghanistan, that's where the pilot starts to lose references and that's where... They, you know, it's, it starts to get pretty dicey in terms of getting on the deck before you can't see anything. So, yeah, certainly a bit of a skill involved in that. Yeah. So how long did you actually spend down the back of a Chinook? So I was served in the Chinook Force. Well, I was in the Air Force for 17 and a half years and was on the Chinook Force for my entire career. So take out maybe the first year of a bit of basic training at Cromwell and then nine months at RAF Shawbury, which was, uh, yeah, it was um, 
ramp, ramping us up nicely to go and work in a big helicopter. But yeah, the rest of the 16 years was all spent at RAF Odium on the on the mighty Chinook. Um, and as part of that, did uh, both the, the Green Wing squadrons that are there, which is 27 squadron and 18 squadron. Well, and I amassed I, 3,000 hours before I left, so I, I, I certainly wow. certainly feel my weight. <laughs> yeah, so what's life like in a Chinook? Because we think of them as big, noisy, vibrating machines. What What's like the quality of life actually like? Uh, well, I'd say big, noisy, vibrating machines. If I was gonna, <laughs> they really. Uh, um, you know what? They're. Um, I really miss it. I, I left the airport in 2019, and I still see a chinook out the window and, and run to the window like a, a five-year-old. Except on nights like tonight, whenever uh, they're doing some night flying currency, and uh, and I know it's really cold and wet out there. And yeah, coming back to the question, that's what it's like. It's like a flying sieve. You know, you've got 120 knot of wind coming through the front door. Uh, and then whenever you're doing under sung lows, that just comes up through the center hatch as well. So it's not exactly a comfortable ride, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, we don't have any air con. So the opposite side of that is that when you go out to Afghanistan and it's 45 degrees outside, there's no air con. So the whole aircraft superheats. And if you're doing a walk around, for example, in that kind of environment and you touch any of the metal parts without your flying gloves on, you could like, physically burn your, burn your skin. Um, and it's noisy, you know, it's a really noisy aircraft and that makes, that brings with it its own challenges really because, you know, as aviators, we all know that comms is key really and the second communications start to break down, things can go wrong very quickly um, and you don't have the option in a chinook of just shouting to someone from the other end of the aircraft. So, uh, and especially when we have troops on board, it can make some stuff really, really difficult to communicate and that cut really came to, you know, to highlight during the merch shouts in Afghanistan when you've got a lot of the medics down the back and it's, it's um it's dark and it's noisy uh, and windy and we're trying to communicate with them so yeah it's interesting yeah. yeah did you want to do this since you were a child or how did you get into it so i don't come from an air force family at all um and my brother decided he wanted to join the army um when he was 17 so he went up to a place back in northern ireland called palace barracks which is where we did all our um all you know the afco was and when he went to do his barb test, which is the entrance test for the army, I went with him and he went in for his exam and there was a magazine on the table, which had a, a guy hanging out the side of a helicopter on what I thought was a rope at the time. So I uh, said to the guy in uniform, I said, what's this job? It looks really good, this guy in the rope. And he went, well, first of all, it's not a rope, it's a wire. And the job is helicopter crewman or loadmaster because it used to, the whole branch used to come under the umbrella of loadmaster. And, uh, I just went, that's it. That's what I want to do. It's like, it looks like the coolest job on the planet. So I was pretty naive. So I think whenever I went through all my interviews in Northern Ireland and got accepted to go across to Cromwell. And if I'm being brutally honest, it was probably two years into the Air Force before I absolutely knew what I was doing, <laughs> as in what job I was doing. I just wanted to be that person on the magazine hanging out the side of a helicopter. So, uh, yeah, that's what inspired me to join up. And, and where did you... Sorry, in go on. No, no, it's all right, carry on. I'll come um, in in a minute. Yeah, whereabouts in the world did you go with the Chinook? Oh, I, do you know what? I've had a really, really blessed life. You know, I've been to, obviously, the war zone, so did two uh, deployments to Iraq. And I, I went to Iraq when I was 21, so I was the youngest air crew to go to Iraq. Um, and I went, I did 10 op herricks. Um, and that's not that unique, really, for a lot of the a lot of the pilots and crewmen actually in the Chinook Force are probably up there, and at least you know seven, eight, and the odd one, nine, ten, eleven, maybe. Um, so you know they were the, the familiar places to go. But before we could go anywhere near that, those places, we had to go and, and do some dust training, like I mentioned earlier about outrunning the dust cloud. So I managed to go to Morocco quite a few times, um, Jordan. Um, and luckily, towards the end of my career, California seemed to be the most popular place to go and outrun the dust. So I got a few deployments to, to our few jets to California, which was definitely <laughs> up there and much better than, than Jordan and Morocco. Um, mm -hmm. And exercises really around Germany and Europe was the main. So sadly, we don't have quite as big a reach as the Herc fleet and some of the fixed wing boys. And we certainly don't stay in hotels like a lot of people believe the RAF do. <laughs> it's mainly tents. But um but it was certainly a good variety. So I, I wanted to just ask a question from from a country. You know, I've, I I don't have a military background at all, so it's hard for me to understand. But when you when you deploy for the first time to a war zone as opposed to a, a training camp in Morocco or something like that, what what does that 
actually feel like that in the run up to that is what, what are you what's kind of running through your mind well, i think i mean before we go anywhere we have to do pre-deployment training here in the uk so we have about two or three weeks at odium where we'll do a lot of intelligence briefs on where we're going uh, we'll do all our weapons training and we as our crew carry pistols as well as rifles so we have to do all our currency on the on the weapons and then the airborne weapons as well we have to do lots of range sorties on 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 those so you're almost mentally preparing yourself for what you're getting into here in the uk before you get there um and then i think the kind of days running up to it um you just almost like anything like when you're going on holiday your your bags are packed and you're ready to go and you just want to get there and get on with the job and i think 90 percent of the people that join the services maybe 100 um we join to do a job and that's what we want to do you know we, we want to go and we want to make ourselves useful and have a purpose so you sort of can't wait to get there and um the the journey out is always a bit of a burgle i'm not going to lie we have to go through a place called bryce norton and usually it's a very tedious kind of process to get ourselves to wherever hot dusty environment we're going to but i i for me it always used to be like the second i'd unpacked my bag and put it away you're there you're in you know that's you and you're settled for the next two or three months so and you just yeah put your put your war hat on and off you go and was that the same for you the tenth time as it was the first time? I mean, clearly you you knew what to expect after nine times. Yeah, I mean, if I compare the first time I went to war versus the the last time, um, I think the first time I was quite naive and excited, really. Um, you know, it was that unknown, and I was really still quite young going to Iraq. But Iraq was very playground compared to anything we saw in Afghanistan. And I always refer in a lot of talks I do now, I'm certainly in the book, about my normality bar. Um, so whenever I was first in Iraq, um, you know, some of the landing sites we'd go into had been mortared the week before. And I remember the first time hearing that, thinking, oh, it's quite dangerous. And uh, the next time we'd go in, it had been mortared, like, the day before. And thinking, oh, God, it's getting a bit spicier. Um, but then when we went to Afghanistan, things ramped up again. And you would find yourself going into landing sites that had been in contact that morning. Uh, then as, as Herrick started to get more and more kinetic, you would go into landing sites that were, like, under contact and you had to go in to get the casualty out but you weren't you never felt like you were in more danger because your normality bar for that danger had been slowly creeping up the whole time um which turns out had quite a detrimental effect on a lot of people because we'd lost that gauge for what's normal and what's not normal but my last step i think i was worn out you know i just i almost wanted the war to be over i still had the same feeling of purpose and want to go and do my job but i was definitely ready for herrick to come to an end by that point Mm -hmm. God. Uh, and, and when when you you were talking about the, the Mert row and you know sometimes you're going into a place which is under contact at the time i i can't quite imagine what it's like when there's some when there's people shooting at you i mean are you so occupied with the job that you're getting on with it or are you not sitting there going what are you doing stop well I mean, that's I what I, I i um i mentioned this in the book actually i think the first time i ever got shot at and could see the person shooting at me but my first thought was how dare he like i was really angry i like how has he got the balls to do that to me so i got very very angry very quickly but you know our mission like our role and our purpose on the aircraft is to man those weapons so you don't have an option to suddenly go someone's shooting at me i'm gonna hide you have to stand there and you have to defend that aircraft behind that weapon um i've had to use it a few times you know mostly in self well the times I've had to open up with a weapon have been in self-defense, really, when someone's been shooting at us. We did have rules of engagement throughout the middle of Herrick, where we were actually well within our legal rights to open up on anyone wearing a black turban north of Highway 1, as they were assumed that they were the enemy. Um, and people did. People that I knew, colleagues that I knew, you know, would not make a point of it, but if they saw someone who was considered enemy, they would, you know, shoot them and kill them. Absolutely illegally able to do so. But for me that weapon you have to respect a weapon if you're given a weapon in your control it takes a whole lot of you know it demands respect and as i went through my career the more loss i saw down the back of the aircraft the more loss of life i saw i think that respect grew for the finality of death so my rules of engagement were always very much a if it's him or me it's him if i have to pull this trigger so i can survive and so i can save the aircraft then then i'm going to do it but yeah it's um it's a big responsibility and and how do you how do you then, I mean, your, your normality bar is, as you say, has gone way high and, and that kind of thing. And then 
then at some point you leave the RAF and we were talking about earlier about you know working in Pusey or something which is which is a you know a not a sleepy a sleepyish town in Wiltshire. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> how, how did it how did surely at that point nothing whatsoever phases you ever again? Well, that's where I came unstuck really in in that I left the Air Force in 2019 and life was really good and I think a lot of veterans as you leave you know you're almost on a bit of a high and you can't wait to see the back of the Air Force by that point that's how it's certainly I, I didn't leave I didn't want to leave I got med boarded out and I actually would have stayed for life if I could have done but by the time I was sort of essentially cut free I was like this is great you know new chapter of life you know fresh start and and I actually was okay for about a year and then in 2020 started to come unravels quite quickly and I think it's because that normality bar had sort of really skewed my judgment on things and I wasn't very good at saying that I was starting to fall apart inside but didn't really want to admit it and just thought you know it's locked I was we were in lockdown at the time and thought well surely everyone's struggling this is lockdown but as the year went on unraveled further and further and then had a uh, like an absolute breakdown in 2020 uh, August 2020 and actually took a massive overdose and tried to end my life um so it was it is something that had gone, you know, I'd had such a successful career in the RAF to becoming this sort of, you know, person that couldn't leave the house, quibbling mess, and then took an overdose. So I was very lucky, came out the other side of it. And being a veteran was put into the veteran's health system very quickly. And essentially spent the last two years putting, bringing the normality back down to where it should be, learning that it's okay to not be okay. And that actually, you know, the best, the best thing to do is talk to people whenever you're in that scenario. And that, you don't have to be unbreakable. I think as a, a female in the forces for a very long time, I never wanted to be a burden. I didn't want to be the, you know, the girl crying around the back of the tent. And don't get me wrong, I was the lads would never have made me feel like that. I was always just one of the gang. And every female I've worked with in the forces has been very much made to feel like that. But it was a self-imposed kind of thing. So I never wanted to be a burden. And um, and what I've realized the hard way really is that it's okay sometimes to go. I'm, I'm not good. I need help. And just talk about it because if I'd have done that before I got to the point of break, <laughs> then it, life would have been a very different story. Yeah. Um, and, and you were saying, I was, we were talking about your book earlier. How, how did your book come about then? So the book was born out of that dark time, really. Um, I, after the overdose, I came out of hospital and so I started my counseling very, very quickly. I was very lucky. I know that the civilian mental health system is not so good so I feel very privileged to have, have had that option um, and throughout my PTSD counselling I started to write a lot of poetry and then took to kind of just writing some memoirs because I'd never done that that's my I don't really have many regrets in fact I don't have any regrets in life but I do wish I'd taken a few more pictures and catalogued my forces career a little bit better other than my logbook which is pretty much full of tipex on every page <laughs> but um so I started to write kind of memoirs and, and three weeks later had essentially a book and um, sent off to a few publishers after a friend encouraged me to, and Penasaur came back and said, we want to publish it. So it was very much a brain dump of, of where I was at the time in terms of, you know, going through the PTSD counselling. And, you know, I think everything in there just needed to come out. And here we are a year later with it on, on the shelves and shops for people to buy, <laughs> which is still blows my mind every day. That's That's an astounding feat to write a book in three weeks. I mean... I write as quickly as I talk. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you type as quickly as you talk there? <laughs> yeah, just a bite. <laughs> wow. And and so what what are you up what are you up to now? What is what is what what's life consist of now? The normality bar is, is, is back near to normal. I don't really want to tell you all because I work okay. for a drone. I work for a drone company. <laughs> 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 but no, it's brilliant. So what we do, I'm really lucky actually. Um, my boss and my team are all ex-military. Um, and we fly the big drones, the Beyond Visual Line of Sight drones that you mentioned earlier. But we are absolutely, we have a great relationship with the CIA and we do lots of, uh, before we do anything, they're the first point of contact and we have to go through a huge process to get anything authorised and get and get sanctioned airspace, etc. So hopefully, coming back to your story earlier, we are not one of those people that get, get flying near aircraft and get in the way. And certainly from a helicopter girl, you know, my entire Air Force career, I, I viewed drones as like the bane of the air. Like they were just, you know, the, the most 
annoying thing in the world whenever we were airborne having to like, watch out for them and just pests really but now that i've had my eyes open to that world properly and seeing how when it's regulated properly it can be quite good uh, yeah it's been it's been it's been really insightful for me so we do a lot of trials and evaluations with drones and and actually drones for good you know i think the people that just buy drones and fire them up into the air to stupid, bit, you know, say flying near aircraft or take pictures right close to aircraft are, are not ideal. But some of the drones that we're using are for NHS trials. And, you know, if we could use a drone instead of having to put me and three other crew members and some force protection nurses into a dangerous landing site to go and deliver blood products to, you know, casually on the ground, surely that's a good thing. So that's kind of what we're working towards in that in that kind of environment. But I don't want to make helicopters redundant because that would always be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the height of your career? Well, I got rid of all helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions about the book here. And there's someone saying there's a great deal on Amazon. And I see that Johnny or Ed or someone has put a link uh, on Amazon in the threads. And then Annabelle has said, can I get an autograph copy? I'll donate to Liz's charity of choice. Oh, thank you so much. Well, actually, Pen and Sword have got some autographed copies already. So if you contact Pen and Sword, Annabelle, then they've got some up there so they can send you one down. There you go. That's it says, I'm up to page 70. It's a great read. And if nothing else, I will be left with the memory of two words, Tato Crisps. <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a story today. Well, I, I spent my, most of my career eating Tato crisp sandwiches in the back of a chinook because <laughs> that's a bit, the only rations we used to get used to be some kind of bland sandwich, usually tuna, which I don't like, and a packet of Tato cheese and onion crisps. So I spent most of my career surviving on those. <laughs> Are you are you sure the RAF don't have hotels and everything all over the place and like people bringing them meals and things? They are, the RAF do, but they don't share them with the dirty helicopter people because we're considered like the poor children of the RAF because we're actually controlled by Joint Helicopter Command. So the the support helicopter fleet that the RAF own is commanded by JHC. So. Uh, there's always a bit of a dispute about uh, budgets in that respect. So whenever we go and exercise, we come under joint helicopter command. So, and they don't pay for hotels. <laughs> so sadly not. Sadly not. Liz, it looks it looks like you're giving a talk at Cosford in May. Is that correct? I am. Yeah, I've got lots of talks lined up for anyone watching. I've got one in May. I'm actually giving one at the Joystick Club. If anyone knows the Joystick Club, um, I went with them, and they're next Monday, Monday the twenty third. And then a week after that, Monday the 30th, I'm down at the Army Museum in Middle Wallop. So, um, and then, yeah, Heli Expo in, the, in June, I'm going to be there for three days as well. So, but yeah, if anyone wants to come to any of those, then please come and, and find me and, and I'll either sign a book or buy a book or whatever. But uh, it's just nice to meet people. That's been the best thing about the book really is just going out and, and engaging with people. And, and I think because of my struggles that I went through and my openness and honestness about it, so many people are contacted me saying it's helped them in some way mentally which is just really good that's all I could ever hope for so but I'm on Twitter and Instagram so if anyone wants to follow me on there at Chinny Chick is my name um, and then, then I can put all the events on there and they can follow me what, what's your name on Twitter so that we can so on, I'm Chinny Chick on Twitter and I'm sorry Chinny Chick on Twitter and uh, Crew Chick Chinny Crew Chick on Instagram Okay, fantastic. Well, and another request: She said, "Would you give a talk to the British Women Pilots Association?" I'd be delighted to, as long as it's biscuits. Yeah, and sandwiches and crisps. Yeah, and some potato crisps, obviously. <laughs> um, so, if as it took you three weeks to um, three weeks to write the book, and and you're not the slowest speaker I've ever heard of. Um, or have ever listened to. Uh, are you, have you got any plans for an audio book version? Hopefully so, yeah. I've uh, met the wonderful Mandy Hickson, who I'm sure you've all heard of and, and know if you haven't already had her on at some point. We, but Mandy and, I call, uh, Mandy and I have never met each other before. And um, because of the mutual book kind of release thing, we uh, we got chatting via the means of social media. And it turns out she doesn't live very far away. So we caught up at the weekend and um, she's been absolutely amazing in giving me some guidance because I'm so fresh into all of this. And I say I never really intended the book to get published. So I'm a bit of a bunny in the headlights really at the minute. And Mandy's got me a uh, someone who can help record the audio book. So that's coming next. Oh, brilliant. And uh, have you got a second book that you're thinking about at the moment? Or? 
Yeah, I've got a few lined up. I've got a few sequels in mind. Uh, and Pe Pen and Sword have very kindly offered to um, publish the next one. So um, watch watch this space for that one. I'm sure there'll be some some little uh, wow. little, little bits coming out about that soon. So, it might excellent. take longer than three weeks. <laughs> I'm quite busy at the minute, so I'm sure it won't take three weeks. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so, someone here is saying uh, you should ask Mandy Hickson to take you to the Ivy for lunch in Win Winchester until it's her round. I'll pass I'm sure she be fine that. I don't know if Winchester's <laughs> ready for Liz and Mandy out with wine. We're going to need a couple of bodyguards with us. We'll issue a note, Tam. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I have to say, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. I'm sorry we all wibbled on a bit. Uh, much at the beginning, we didn't get you on earlier, but it's been a brilliant half an hour that we've we mm. been. Huge, huge respect for what you did, and yeah. huge respect for, for for where you are now, and and being so um, open and and honest and stuff about about that because it clearly that's not a an easy an yeah. easy time. As well, the more you talk about it, the easier it gets, and that's kind of the message, really. You know, I've talked about it a lot since the books come out, and. Uh, I think that I tell people to give their mental health a, a scale of one to 10 now. So when I ask people, how are they? And you get the obligatory, I'm okay, back. I ask twice. I ask, are you sure you're okay? And I also ask them to give me a number. And that's um, that's a good message to take away if anyone's watching this. Just give your mental health a number. And it seems to have helped me out of a, a pretty black spot. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, absolutely fantastic. Huge, huge thanks from me and I'm sure from everybody else here. Yeah, um, thank you, Liz. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. I feel kind of a little bit guilty moving on, to be honest, but <laughs> we're kind of running out of time. And there's still a couple of bits we have to do. So, yeah, and, you, and I was wondering, maybe, uh, maybe we can have a flyer club fly in somewhere that Liz might be able to get to, because I think flyer club members might appreciate meeting the opportunity to meet Liz. Yeah, oh, I'd be honoured, absolutely honoured. Yeah, let me know, right. and I'll be there. Fantastic. You don't live a million miles from Popham, I'm guessing. So, oh, it's literally just on the road. <laughs> well, there we go. Maybe we can do something because Popham's a great place to go. So, and maybe yeah. we can do fundraising for durability at the same time or something. I would love yeah, that. that. I'd love to see more. That, that would be great. We, and then from Popham, we could just hop to Blackbush and go and see the people at Durability for tuna <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> All right. Liz, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure and honour talking to you. Um, so we must must be time for fancy hang. Must be time for fancy. Thank you. Cheers, Liz. Thank you. Oh, who broke? I don't know. What, I don't know. What, uh, who knows? Oh, who knows? It's the speeded up fancy hanger. So um, this. So we're, we're running a, a little behind, but uh, I think that's so it's so worth it. I'm mm. such a great. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. Let's yeah. rattle through Fantasy Hanger. Let everyone go get this. Bring a little sunshine Enjoy. into our lives right now because the weather is awful. Uh, we decided we would pick our fancy destinations for some flying and an aeroplane to go with it. So who's first? Uh, looking at my list, you are, Ed. Oh, great. It's me. Uh, okay, so I'm not a big right. fan of, of too hot or too humid. Um, so I picked Hawaii. Where uh, checking the weather, it's currently 27 degrees and 55% humidity. And my aeroplane of choice, well, it would be the fabulous little air cam, uh, which is, and it, I'd have it on amphibious floats. Now, amazingly, there's 14 airports to choose from in Hawaii and brilliant volcanic landscapes, lots of vegetation and 750 miles of ocean coastline. And that will make for some good fun flying. And you can see that they've taken air cams there before and done it. And it's got two Rotex 912s and brilliant open cockpit. So your nice, safe, fantastic flying experience. And uh, the only downside right now seems to be that it's 18 hours of airline flying together. <laughs> Which is a significant downside, but nonetheless, that does look particularly appealing. I have to say, when you look outside during the day here, all a bit grey and wet. Yes. Johnny, you're next. Yeah, right. I'd go south of the US. I'd take a nice shiny RV, maybe a 14, and I'd go and zip around, probably start at Monument Valley. Sorry, and I think I'm clicking at the same time as you. Um, there you go. Mo Monument Valley, Grand Canyon, Sedona. And then probably end up in somewhere like Las Vegas, but I think some of the scenery around there—it's a you know very sparsely populated area. Um, I think it'd be gorgeous to fly around. 
um and yeah. those those rock towers must must be brilliant to fly around in a something like an rv nice and low and fast they are but you do get prosecuted if you do that johnny yeah. well <laughs> even even in a g reg <laughs> <laughs> probably wait and see what happens to the drone guy and see if you fancy it again okay dave you're up next right well i've uh chosen somewhere a bit closer to home I've, the eastern europe the eastern mediterranean of europe so countries like slovenia um slovenia croatia montenegro and the east coast of italy that sort of area there and i would take an icon a5 which is a little amphibian this is a picture over montenegro uh this is i think that's scada lake which is a place where uh, montenegro is making a base a center for uh, sport flying sport flying and seaplane flying uh, nice weather middle of summer nice and warm great place to fly a seaplane and uh go swimming was that, okay. that didn't look like an icon a5 dave i think that was a russian amphibian the, the picture i did supply a picture of an icon a5 now ah, right but, but I, using my space <laughs> i can tell that that is a russian bear amphibian right <laughs> I, didn't you upload that dave i did upload that that is a picture of okay. montenegro and it is okay. the lake uh, maybe I've missed the A5. Anyway, anyway, so, right. I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier in this, so I'm going to run past this quickly. I love this. Dave gets burned. That's it. I love the sun, but I also love the snow. Look at this. Absolutely stunning, stunning weather. It would be so much nicer than the rain. What's better than a Jodel D140 on skis to go exploring the Alps, go land on a few glaciers, land on a few outy ports, outy surfaces with those skis down, just absolutely stunning. And when you've done that, get out, have a hot chocolate, strap your skis on, go for a bit of a ski. Some of the best flying I've ever done has been in the Alps on skis. Uh, I haven't done anywhere near enough of it, but the bit I did was absolutely stunningly special and would be so nice compared to all this rainy, pooey, shitty weather we've got at the moment. So there you go. Ed, <laughs> don't tell me you've won. No, I'm not sure. And um, we've had a few suggestions. John Milner says Venice in a TB20. Nice choice. Dave White Ooh, yeah. eating his chickens before they've hatched. Because he's saying Treasure, treasure K in the uh, Palmers arriving in an RV15 on floats. RV15 not yet available. But I, you know, win with pigs when it's done. It's a good choice. Yeah. John Park says Ed wins. Strong start. <laughs> Ed wins. Uh, will Dave win? Probably not. Um, <laughs> Dave wins. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, Stuart Rue said, no flying down the canyon, Johnny, unless you don't want to get back out mm -hmm. in 45 degrees. Oh, okay, yeah, good point. Good. Dave gets banned. Ed wins. I've flown over that lake, he says, in a Russian EC-135. Strong choice from Dave. Ian wins. I hate to say it, but Ian wins. It's Why do you hate to say it? Frankly, it's a dead heat. All shall have prizes. Ian oh, wins. Ed wins. Ed, uh, Ian a close second. Ian wins by miles. Ooh, Dave wins. Controversial. How well done, oh, Ian. Man. How about Aaron? Okay. Wins? He went at Florida asking for a friend. <laughs> Johnny wins. Yeah. You have to go to New Zealand. <laughs> Evening all. Yeah. Probably a bit late. Ed won? Question mark. <laughs> Kia, what are you up to? Um, right, okay. Thank you very much for that. We'll take that as a draw for everyone winning then. Uh, Dave, do you want to rattle through the uh, events as there are some yep. starting to crop up? Just start to, yeah, starting to come through. Uh, there's a there's a flying coming up at Tiverton Airfield. I think that's right. in Norfolk on the 14th of January. Um, looking slightly further ahead, on the 4th and 5th of February, Shuttleworth is holding an engineering open workshop. Now, if you think about going to that, and, I, and it's always a great event, you need to really book it because uh, they've got another event at the same day called a Spitfire sitting experience, and that's already sold out. So um, um, anyway, so if you want to go to Shuttleworth, see the open workshop, 4th and 5th of February. Just looking a bit further ahead, Sun and Fun in Florida, 28th of March to the 2nd of April, Aero Friedrich Schaffen, 19th to the 22nd of April, tickets are now on sale. And Oshkosh, of course, 24th to the 30th of July, tickets are on sale there as well. And lots of amazing talks from Liz all over the place. All at yeah. that's right, yes. So 
That's good. Well, I think we are eight minutes over, so we just rattle through the last bit. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, we'll be with you shortly. And thank you very much, team. We'll see you all next Wednesday if you're a Fly Club member, uh, next Thursday if you're not. And if you're not a club member, it's only five quid a month, and you get huge amounts of stuff for five quid a month. So go join up now, and that will be fantastic for all of us. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a, have a great week, and look forward to that great weather that's coming next week, or slightly better weather anyway. That's it. See you all next week. See, See you. you all next week. Bye.